Memorial Lectureship Series. Uh, I uh, knew John uh, during the years 2003, 4, and 5. I was a fellow growing into faculty member at University of Pittsburgh, and I would go to ECOG meetings regularly, and John was an equal, uh, equally uh, regular at attendee and participant at the ECOG Thoracic Committee. And uh, those meetings, as you know, go on for two, two and a half days, and uh, we would hang out. And there were three things that struck me about John and I want to share. One is uh, something Barbara alluded to, which is how uh, welcoming, friendly, and generous he was with junior faculty and fellows uh, in terms of supporting their ideas, uh, encouraging them. As an early participant in ECOG, uh, it was important to me to have somebody like John who actually felt like I belonged in that committee and my ideas can be discussed. And uh, for that, I will be thankful to him. The second was his commitment to the cooperative groups. Uh, John, when I was there, was not leading any trial at ECOG, but he was there for every meeting, providing input into the kind of trials ECOG Akron should be doing to move the field forward. And that meant more than him leading any specific trials within ECOG Akron. And it's very uh, rewarding for me to see AL continue on the tradition with strong contributors to the thoracic group uh, in the SWAG with Roy uh, and uh, so many of you here in the audience that are carrying that legacy forward. And as you all know, the cooperative groups are close to our hearts, and this is how we do clinical trials that no pharma would do and really answer important questions in cancer. And the third uh, memory I have of John was he was very cool to hang out with. And in those days, we would have occasional meetings in Las Vegas. And there was one particular meeting where the meeting was done early and the faculty had uh, the rest of the evening. And John said, don't worry, I have the nicest place. I know where to take you all. And we went to this uh, place where we had dinner and spent a few hours together. That was uh, truly memorable. So uh, I, I really want to thank uh, Roy and the uh, John Muren family for uh, having me at this talk today, and uh, it's doubly special. Uh, these are my disclosures. And what I want to show is, uh, over the next 45 or 50 minutes, some of the exciting advances that have happened in lung cancer. Uh, I'm particularly uh, excited about uh, the synergies between your thoracic group and the research interests of our thoracic group at Emory. While we interact with each other at the cooperative group level and many other levels across trials, our research themes, as you will see, are very similar to some of the things that are being pursued by the group here. And I think that provides us with opportunities to work together moving forward even more than what we have. So for a long time, progress in lung cancer looked like this. It was very slow. Things were not moving. Things were moving at a snail space. Platinum-based chemotherapy was around for a very long time. We had not made much improvement beyond that. And in the area of targeted therapies until 2004, we really did not have uh, a target, even though we had targeted therapies around. But that has all turned around now, and clearly lung cancer is at the forefront of individualized therapies and targeted therapies and immunotherapy in uh, the present time. So when I talk about targeted therapies, I'm going to focus primarily on EGFR, which is where our group has been doing a lot of work. And in the area of immunotherapy, uh, we have been working with uh, understanding biomarkers, thinking about novel combination approaches, and how we can integrate immunotherapy in the context of uh, the present standard uh, treatments. So I'll show you some of the work we've done at our group with uh, immunotherapy and biomarkers. Lung adenocarcinoma is no longer one disease. Uh, we know now from a number of national efforts that you can break down lung, lung cancer into many different genomically driven subsets. And these are data from the Lung Cancer Mutation Consortium II effort. Your group was part of it. We were part of it. Dara Eisner from Colorado reported this just a few months ago in clinical cancer research. And this involved getting together uh, across uh, 16 major academic institutions across the country, including institutions that had a SPORE and program projects, uh, collecting uh, molecular data from lung cancer adenocarcinoma patients. And you clearly see that in two out of three patients, there is a dominant driver event. This doesn't factor in the uh, loss of function events such as P53 and LKB1 that are common also in lung cancer. But uh, what we see here are that EGFR mutations contribute to about 15 to 16 percent of the patients. Uh, KERAS, which accounts for 25 percent of the lung cancers, is an area where we're still searching for effective treatments. But some of the smaller pieces of the pie are getting sorted out now so that there are effective treatment options 
for ALK positive lung cancer, for BRAF positive lung cancer, and for ROS1 positive lung cancer. So if you look at adenocarcinoma, nearly 20 to 25% of the patients actually will be treated with targeted agents specific to their driver gene and not generic treatment approaches. Now, we have also learned that uh, giving targeted therapy to these patients uh, results in better outcomes. Uh, these are, again, data from the Lung Cancer Mutation Consortium study uh, from the CCR paper, where you see uh, the three cohorts of patients. Uh, for patients who have a driver mutation and are treated with targeted therapy, they experience the best survival outcomes. And then in the middle are patients who have a driver mutation, but they did not have either a targeted option or they did not receive a targeted therapy. And the green represents patients who did not have uh, any uh, treat sorry, the blue represents treatment without any uh, target. So really giving targeted therapy in patients with target has a major impact on outcomes. And this has been substantiated from national studies in Japan, where in the era of EGFR inhibition, the overall survival for lung cancer patients have substantially improved from what used to be a median survival of 15, 14 months in Japan to now 28, 29 months uh, because of uh, targeted options. Now, we used to think of EGFR mutations as uh, one entity. There are exon 19 and exon 21 mutations, and these were treated with EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors thanks to a number of randomized clinical trials that showed that targeted therapy is superior to chemotherapy. Uh, we're now also beginning to understand that co-mutations may actually determine prognosis, even in a patient with EGFR-activating mutation. Here you see P53 mutations. If a patient had EGFR and P53 co-mutation, their outcomes were not quite as good as somebody with EGFR mutation and P53 wild type. Uh, so this information, I think, is going to guide us to even individualize therapy within EGFR as we move forward, and I think will be an important research question. There are other co-mutations besides P53 that have been reported, and uh, we will be studying them uh, soon. So what's new in the EGFR field? Well, we now are in the era of mutation-specific EGFR inhibitors. These are drugs that have far greater selectivity to the mutant receptor compared to the wild-type receptor, and that means less toxicity for patients and the ability to administer these drugs for uh, not just months and months, months and months, but even years uh, because of their favorable tolerability profile and ability to achieve higher efficacy. We have now recent data on studies that compare different generations of EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors to see which of those are optimal for patients with lung cancer. We're beginning to understand how to manage acquired resistance and even delay or uh, basically push the cancer cells in a different direction than in a specific pathway they would have uh, taken to develop resistance to targeted therapy. And we're learning a lot about combination approaches. Now, when we look at the EGFR mutation landscape just in the North American patient population, uh, you see different subsets. The two most common subsets are the exon 19 and exon 21 mutations that account for 85% of all EGFR mutations that we see. However, you see that there are a few other less common mutations, and uh, the EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors don't work as well for those less common mutations. Exon 20 insertions is an interesting group. I'll briefly talk about it later in the talk. Until recently, there were no good treatment options. These exon 20 insertions do not respond to EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibition, but there is a new class of drugs that seem to be active uh, in this group of patients, and I'll touch upon that as well. So when you look at exon 19 and 21 mutations, we've long known that EGFR inhibition results in better outcomes compared to chemotherapy. But the key observation was, when you follow these patients who benefit from these drugs, they develop acquired resistance by a new mutation called the T790M mutation. And that mutation occurs in 50 to 60% of the patients. And osimertinib is a drug that was originally developed to block the T790-mediated resistance, and it's in the market for that indication. But we then asked the question, can you give this drug up front in order to delay or prevent the emergence of T790-mediated resistance? And based on what we saw both in the lab and in early clinical experiences, this study was conducted. We just published this about four months ago in the New England Journal, and this study led to the approval of osimertinib in the frontline space by the US FDA just about four weeks ago. And this was a head-to-head -head comparison of osimertinib 
to what was then a standard EGFR inhibitors in the form of gefitinib and erlotinib, which were the earlier generations of EGFR inhibitors. Osimertinib was the newer generation, and this trial was designed to compare the efficacy in terms of progression-free survival in this trial. This was a global trial. 556 patients were enrolled. Primary endpoint was progression-free survival. It was double-blind placebo control. And what we've learned was exciting. The median progression-free survival was improved from 10 months in the control group to nearly 19 months for patients treated with osimertinib. And this represented a 54% reduction in the risk of progression. At the time of this analysis, the survival results were quite early. The maturity was 20%. But even there, we saw a very favorable trend of hazard ratio 0.63 with a p-value that was 0. 007 uh, only cannot be called significant because the data are immature, but I would uh, describe this as a very favorable trend. This also uh, was a more tolerated, better tolerated treatment. Osimertinib has less diarrhea, less skin rash, and overall less grade 3, 4 severe adverse events, and patients were exposed to the drug for longer. Uh, the patients who developed a response, the median duration of response with erlotinib or gefitinib was 8 months, whereas it was 17 months for patients treated with osimertinib. We also noticed that there was more brain activity with this drug, and I know that uh, managing brain metastases is a unique area of research interest here to the group. Uh, what we see here is uh, the PFS for patients who came into the FLORA trial with baseline history of brain metastases, and the overall hazard ratio for this group is 0 0.47, which is very similar to the overall hazard ratio for the entire group of patients that suggests that osimertinib is also effective in brain metastases. Uh, if the drug wasn't working well in brain metastases, the hazard ratio for this group of patients would have been far uh, worse than the overall uh, hazard ratio for the entire group. We also know from other studies that osimertinib has better brain penetration. In primate models where they were able to tag this with a tracer, higher concentrations of the drug were noted in the brain tissue. So this drug uh, seems to be among the class of EGFR inhibitors, the one with best brain activity. So that led to a new paradigm in the approval of osimertinib in the frontline space, which immediately prompts the question, how do patients develop resistance to osimertinib? And we have some data. The uh, resistance data from Flora are still not ready, and uh, they are maturing. But what I will show you are some limited data from our frontline experience in a phase 1b study. So in this trial, we treated uh, approximately 60 patients with newly diagnosed EGFR-mutated advanced-stage lung cancer. And they all received osimertinib. And we saw a median progression-free survival of approximately 20 months in this group. And this experience was uh, instrumental in designing the FLORA trial. So in this trial, we did not have biopsies at progression. We collected blood samples. And out of 42 patients who had uh, progressive disease, uh, we had samples from 38 patients uh, after they progressed. And we looked for circulating tumor DNA in these patients. And out of 38, 19 patients had no circulating DNA detectable whatsoever. And 19 had some circulating tumor DNA. And among those 19, only nine had actionable mutations. The others did not have any resistance mutations. And you can see the uh, type of mutations we saw. Uh, a slew of alternate pathway or even EGFR dependence related mutations are seen. The C797S mutation is probably the one that comes to mind as potentially targetable. Uh, about 20% of the patients who develop osimertinib seem to develop this. And from our own institutional experience, we're also seeing more meta-amplification as a mechanism of resistance. And uh, we saw one case here, but obviously ctDNA is not very good for picking up amplification. So when we do tumor biopsies, we start seeing meta-amplification. And between C797 and MET, we think you can pick up 40 to 50% of osimertinib resistance patients. Now, another interesting uh, development here was we compared the median time to disease progression for patients who had detectable ctDNA versus those who did not. And you see, see that at the bottom of the slide where patients with presence of ctDNA in the tumor had a median time to progression of 13 months, whereas patients who did not have the shed DNA had a greater median time to progression of 20 months. So even shedding DNA is an indication that uh, there is more aggressive biology there 
compared to a tumor that's not shedding, and that could explain some of the differences we see in terms of uh, resistance. I also show you uh, a small series of patients reported from the Farber group. Uh, they had 33 patients that had received osimertinib in the second line setting, and they conducted tumor biopsies in all of these patients. And what you see on this uh, uh, swimmer plot is the duration of therapy for each patient. And as you can see, the top half of the uh, slide shows patients who did really well, and the bottom half are patients who did not do quite so well with osimertinib. And the colors are for specific resistance mechanisms. So you see a lot of purple in the top, which are patients who develop the C797S mutation. So this mutation often happens later in the course of treatment and is seen more commonly in patients who derive greater benefit. And this indicates that there is continued EGFR dependence on these patients. And this dependence happens by the development of the C797S mutation. And this is the site where osimertinib covalently binds to the receptor. And by developing the C797S, it renders osimertinib less effective for these patients. When you look at all the LO, these are patients who did not do well. The resistance mechanisms often are loss of T790 or C797, T790 basically is gone from these. So they develop very different alternative pathways. And this seems to happen very early on in the course of treatment. So you may be able to track very early into therapy whether the patient is going to be in the top category or lower category. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it will be important to look at this as uh, our next step in moving the field forward. This is another piece of data that shows that if you had a patient who was shedding DNA in the blood and you followed them, you can very early on during the course of treatment predict who's going to do well and who will not. Uh, this uh, was the data from, these were the data from the Aura 3 trial we conducted. We compared chemo with osimertinib and T790 positive patients. And these patients all had blood at baseline and blood at sequential uh, at time points during therapy. And what you see here is at the six-week time point after you start therapy, if a patient's blood shows clearance of the circulating tumor DNA, those patients did much better compared to those who had persistence. And in fact, we once again saw three different groups of patients within this one uh, biological subset. One is the group where you don't see any ctDNA at baseline before they even start any therapy. That group had the best outcome with nearly 21-month PFS. The second was the group that had ctDNA but cleared it within six weeks of therapy, and that group had 11-month PFS. And the third group was the one that had it at baseline and in spite of therapy continued to have the ctDNA, and they had by far the uh, least favorable outcomes with the median PFS of 5.7 months. Now, we will present this data, uh, comparable data, on the FLORA study uh, at the uh, WCLC meeting. But what I can tell you is even in the FLORA study, without breaking any embargoes, we are seeing a very similar trend. At three weeks, you can predict who is going to do well and who is not based on ctDNA clearance. So uh, that is, I think, going to guide a lot of what we're doing. And I'll show you a slide tying these together in the next minute or two. But I do want to point out another development that has happened in the EGFR field, which is good, which is this drug decomitinib, which is a previous generation of EGFR inhibitor, uh, which has now been compared to gefitinib, the first generation versus the second generation. And in this study, we saw a modest improvement in progression-free survival, nine versus 14 and a half months. Uh, but it came at the expense of more toxicity. The uh, second generation drugs are irreversible EGFR inhibitors, but they are not selective to the mutant receptor. So they affect wild type and mutant receptor, and we see that in the form of higher incidence of grade three skin rash, diarrhea, and need for dose reductions. We now know from an ASCO abstract that went online last week that this trial showed improvement in overall survival. And this would be the first trial in the EGFR landscape, prospective trial to show a survival benefit with an EGFR inhibitor in a patient with EGFR mutation. And the hazard ratio is 0 0.76. Now we will learn a lot more uh, about this uh, results at the meeting next week. These are just numbers based on the abstract, but I think this tells us that we are moving ahead in patients with EGFR mutations, and we are making an impact in changing the biology of the disease. So in all of these, uh, develop, with all of these developments, if I were to design a trial in EGFR mutated patients, how would I see this playing out? Well, this is, uh, a putative algorithm where if you had an exon 19 or 21 mutation, I would start them with osimertinib, I would collect blood on them at baseline, 
and uh, check the blood again in three weeks. And if they end up having persistence of ctDNA, uh, which I would call uh, as the group with a less favorable prognosis, we should start thinking about a clinical trial for those patients at that time point. And I would favor a combination approach that you add osimertinib plus another drug that could potentially delay the emergence of resistance. And in our institutional experience, we're very excited about MEK inhibition as a strategy. And uh, uh, I'll show you some preclinical data to support that, but I think that would be a trial I would come up with. Now, there are some logistical reasons because there are not many MEK inhibitors around, and the companies that have them have uh, uh, different uh, reasons not to uh, enter the EGFR field. The second group of patients we're going to see are those who benefit from osimertinib, go on for north of 20 months, two years or so, and develop the C797S resistance. And for those patients, I think giving a first-generation EGFR inhibitor like gefitinib or erlotinib should be able to salvage them. Uh, we have heard of anecdotal cases here and there, but I think we need to work together across institutions to collect some more experience in this area. And then the third group would be the MET pathway activation, where I once again think that giving osimertinib plus either a MET inhibition or MEK inhibition will be a good strategy to reverse resistance in these patients. And then the fourth group of patients where we would give chemotherapy because they don't have a defined a good mechanism of resistance could be the group where we actually investigate chemotherapy plus immunotherapy as that's becoming more uh, mainstream for the treatment of lung cancer. Now another combination to watch out for dates back to the year 2011, and this is Roy's paper in Lancet where uh, he was among the pioneers in developing the combination approach of erlotinib and bevacizumab. Now, in an unselected group of patients, this trial did not show survival benefit. But what you would see here is in the EGFR mutated group right here, the hazard ratio was very favorable for the erlotinib bevacizumab group. Now, that observation was sitting there for some time. Nobody pursued it until the Japanese groups took upon uh, the regimen and developed it. And they, in fact, showed that the data that Roy uh, showed in the Lancet paper was duplicated and uh, confirmed in this randomized phase two trial conducted in Japan. Uh, median PFS was 16 months with bevacizumab and erlotinib compared to nine months with erlotinib alone. Now, we know from an abstract, again, that will show the data next week, that this trial, while it was positive for PFS, led to the approval of this regimen in Europe, did not show survival benefit. However, there is a phase three trial that was done as follow-up to this by the West of Japan Oncology Group that is being reported in the oral session at ASCO next week that on the abstract shows positivity for the combination of erlotinib and bevacizumab. So I think this combination is going to be another important uh, strategy forward. It doesn't have to be erlotinib. It could be your favorite EGFR inhibitor in combination with an anti-angiogenic strategy to study it further. One of the uh, approaches I mentioned was MEK inhibition, and that's based on our uh, investigators at Emory uh, looking at the de ERK dependent BIM phosphorylation as a mechanism of resistance. We've known that BIM is necessary for apoptosis, and BIM polymorphisms are seen in a small subset of patients. And there have been reports out of Asia that if you have a tumor with BIM polymorphism, those patients are the ones that don't respond to EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibition. But in this series of experiments, as Xiong Sun and his uh, uh, lab looked at various resistance mechanisms, what they found was uh, BIM degradation mediated by ERK was an important factor in acquired resistance. What happens is when ERK is active, it phosphorylates BIM, which tags it for degradation. And when you don't have BIM, you stop responding to targeted therapies because your cells can't undergo apoptosis. And he showed that... Uh, uh, ERK phosphorylation goes up in the situation of acquired resistance. And when you block ERK activation, in fact, there is uh, synergistic activity. And here you see uh, animal data that combining a MEK inhibitor with an EGFR inhibitor in the setting of acquired resistance resulted in favorable outcomes. So this is a combination approach that uh, uh, we're excited about. Uh, there is a phase one experience in AstraZeneca's uh, uh, for initial studies, studies portfolio that combined their MEK inhibitor with osimertinib and also showed some promising data. So uh, this is something that we're hoping to pursue as a clinical trial. Another pathway we're working on uh, where uh, this month is an important month for us is targeting MER-TK. Uh, MER belongs to a family of tyrosine kinases referred to as TAM. Uh, 
which stack, uh, stands for Tyro3, Axel, and uh, MER. And MER uh, has downstream signals that uh, basically turn on proliferative pathways. It crosstalks with EGFR and is uh, seen highly expressed in EGFR mutated tumors that develop acquired resistance to EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And uh, these are data from Dr. Doug Graham uh, from our uh, pediatrics group. Uh, he uh, was initially looking at MER-TK as a target in AML, but got interested after finding that in EGFR mutated tumors, this is a very relevant target. And this paper is under review on CCR, and we hope it'll get accepted in the next few weeks. But essentially, uh, what you see here is acquired resistance to osimertinib is mediated in many situations by activation of MER-TK. And uh, they then screened a number of drugs to develop a MER-TK inhibitor. And in fact, one of the uh, lead compounds was MRX2843. Uh, in preclinical models, it showed that it could reverse resistance to EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibition. Uh, this resulted in further development of MRX2843. And uh, the first in human trial of MRX2843 just got active at Emory this month. And our first patient will be treated in the phase one study next week. And our hope is once we determine the single agent doses of 2843, we'll be able to combine it with osimertinib in patients with EGFR mutated disease as the follow-up study. Now, MER-TK also has effects on the immune system, and uh, in addition to its direct effects on mediating acquired resistance, as I mentioned, this is uh, a cartoon that shows that MER is expressed in macrophages in a variety of solid tumor models, and uh, in fact, it uh, results in suppression of tumor immunity. So when you block MER, uh, preclinical evidence suggests that it can turn on the immune microenvironment to render it more susceptible to immune manipulation. Uh, we plan to study this further. At this time, what we have are relatively preliminary data to nail down the mechanisms of uh, the direct effect of MER on immune uh, microenvironment. So this is the uh, phase one uh, clinical trial we're planning. This is uh, proposed in our SPORE that is uh, under review by the NCI, where we have patients with EGFR mutation who will get a combination of osimertinib plus MRX2843. Uh, one group of patients, there will be 20 patients that will be osimertinib naive, and then we will be testing the same combination in 20 patients who develop acquired resistance to osimertinib to see if we can reverse resistance as one strategy and prevent resistance as another strategy. And there are tumor biopsies built in both pre- and post-treatment in these patients to understand the biological downstream effects of inhibition of MER-TK with EGFR inhibition. Now, one question that always comes up in conversations about EGFR is, do PD-1 inhibitors work? And this is an excellent uh, editorial that uh, uh, Scott Jeringer and Katie Politi from here published about two years ago in CCR. And they asked this question, uh, PD-1 access inhibitors in EGFR and ALK-driven lung cancers, is it a lost cause? Uh, there are some uh, lines of evidence that suggest that uh, perhaps there is still some room to be hopeful that these drugs can work. We just don't know how. Uh, but uh, I came across this abstract that you will see more about next week, where the UCLA group did a small study. They took patients with EGFR mutations, screened them for PDL1, and they selected the high PDL1 group and gave them first-line immunotherapy instead of, chemo, uh, instead of EGFR inhibition. And uh, what they were planning to do was enroll 25 patients. They got 11 patients, and uh, they saw only one out of 11 responses. They shut the trial down. And interestingly enough, that one responder turns out not to have the EGFR mutation when they went back and resequenced. So this puts to rest, in my mind at least, the notion that a patient with EGFR mutated tumor, no matter how high their PDL1 expression is, they should get targeted therapy and not uh, immunotherapy in the front line. The EMPOWER trial, which looked at chemo plus bevacizumab uh, and atezolizumab, showed that in the cohort of EGFR mutated patients, there seems to be a favorable hazard ratio. Uh, these are patients who had previously received EGFR inhibition and then uh, went on to this trial. Uh, and the notion from this trial was perhaps giving chemo plus uh, PDL1 inhibitor may be helpful for these patients. I think these are encouraging, but relatively small group of patients. We've not heard any details about whether these, what mutations these patients had, exon 19 or exon 21, what EGFR TKI they had, did they have T790, what's the duration of response. So I think uh, 
we need to see all of that information before we can put this data in perspective and decide how best to use this uh, for our patients. And uh, the other emerging area in EGFR world is the insertion 20 mutations. And uh, these mutations are seen in about 9 to 10% of all EGFR mutations. And what happens is this mutation renders the EGFR binding pocket relatively rigid that these drugs don't get in and block the receptor. And in fact, the post-C helix uh, that you see in the blue is the region where the presence of mutation alters the binding pocket in a manner that the EGFR TKAs don't work. If you have the C helix mutations, uh, erlotinib, jefitinib seem to be active, but it's the post-C helix mutations that they don't work. And last week, this paper was uh, published by uh, John Haymack and uh, Robisha from the MD Anderson group, where they have worked on a drug called paziotinib. This drug seemed to fit into the binding pocket of the insertion 20s really well. And this, uh, in a preliminary cohort of 11 patients, had a response uh, of about seven patients. And this study is being uh, enlarged to a larger sample size, and we'll hear about it in the upcoming months. So this presents promise for patients with EGFR insults in 20 mutations. At ECOG Akron, uh, Dr. Zosha Petraska and uh, her group has brought in this trial. This is now active. It's a small study with a higher dose of osimertinib. This builds on Jeff Engelman's PDX data from insertion 20 mutations that showed that higher doses of osimertinib could be effective in interrupting cell signaling. So 160 milligrams is the dose. It's a very small study of 20 patients, and we built in a third stage. If we see enough responses in 20 patients, we would be able to expand the trial with a registrational intent uh, to get this drug approved based on this trial. So uh, this just kicked off. The first patient was enrolled last week, and we hope to uh, get this done quickly so we can find the answers. So that was an uh, uh, overview on EGFR as uh, we have approached it. I want to shift gears and uh, finish up in the next 10 minutes talking about uh, how targeting immunotherapy is taking off in lung cancer and what we're doing to approach that. So uh, as you are well aware of, immunotherapy in non-small cell lung cancer is a proven approach. It's available in the second line setting. In the first line setting for patients with high PDL1 expression, Pembro is superior to chemotherapy. And more recently at ASCR, where Roy did an elegant discussion of a study that showed chemo plus Pembro was better than chemo alone in patients, regardless of the PDL1 expression status. So, this has really put PDL1 and PD1 expression uh, inhibition in the mainstream of lung cancer therapy. Uh, the biomarkers, obviously, is an important question, how to approach biomarkers. And initially, PDL1 expression was developed, and this is a beautiful paper by David Rim, looking at various PDL1 assays uh, done uh, in uh, various clinical trials across commercial entities. And we had the uh, pleasure of writing a commentary for this in JAMA Oncology. And essentially, now this issue seems to have been settled that many of these antibodies that are used to look for PDL1 expression seem to have a good amount of cross validation, except for perhaps one assay. So, PDL1 expression is now used to select therapy. Uh, PDL1 expression high is seen in about a third of the patients. Intermediate PDL1 expression is seen in another third, and a third of the patients are PDL1 negative. Another biomarker, in this case, it was the inverse scenario. I presented the data, and David Rim discussed it at AACR. Uh, this was looking at tumor mutation burden in a phase two study of ipilimumab and nivolumab. What we saw here was tumor mutation burden using a cutoff of 10 mutations per megabase on the foundation one assay seem to discriminate patients who benefit from those who don't. So this is now also being uh, seen as a potential biomarker. Now, while these biomarkers were developed at Emory, we had the pleasure of working together with Dr. Rafi Ahmed, who uh, is a premier immunobiologist in the world, and his seminal observations that PD-1 act pathway uh, activation results in T-cell exhaustion was fundamental to development of PD-1-based therapy uh, a few years down the road. So we got together said, let's start with something very simple and try to understand how these drugs work. So we collected blood samples in patients who were getting PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors. At the time we started, these drugs were not in the market. These were all phase one studies or phase two studies that we were doing at Emory as part of multicenter studies. And uh, we had a small cohort in this paper in PNAS last year, 29 patients. So we collected blood at regular time points. And we said, let's measure what's happening in the blood. And what we saw at the first cut was that these patients who got PD-1 inhibitors had 
proliferation of CD8 T cells, and we looked at that based on KI67. And you can see here in the slide that CD4s or Tregs are not going up. It's the CD8 T cells, which are uh, KI67 positive, that are going up. So this told us that there's something happening. The immune system is responding to the PD-1 inhibition. Then we asked the question, what are these T cells that are expanding? Why are they expanding? Well, the T cells that are expanding have the effector characteristics. As you know, when you have an effector T cell, the BCL2 level goes down because you don't want these cells uh, to, uh, uh, you know, the memory cells have a lot of BCL2 because you don't want them to die soon, whereas the effector cells, you want them to be around for a short time and go off right away. Uh, and we saw uh, expression of BCL2 low cells higher. Uh, we saw Grand B, ICOS, Costa military signaling. So we saw a number of things that told us that these cells are positive for effector characteristics. And we also saw that these cells had expressed co-stimulatory molecules in the form of CD28, CD27, and ICO. So this is a purposeful proliferation of a subset of the T cells. These are PD-1 positive T cells. These are proliferating because they are seeing TCR signaling, and they are uh, effector in characteristic, and they have co-stimulatory molecules, which help them cause anti-cancer effects. And based on this, we then looked at what happens uh, to other signals that are also amplified. We saw that CTLA-4 was also turned on. Co-inhibitory signals also go up, which is, again, a characteristic of effector cell that is seeing uh, uh, antigen-derived uh, TCR signaling. So all of these told us that this could be an important biological effect that could determine how a patient responds. And we broadly see four patterns of response when we specifically focused in on the KI67 positive CD8 T cells, there were some patients who had no response. They were flat despite EG, uh, PD-1 inhibition. There was one second group of patients who had an early peak, an early meaning three, four weeks into therapy, and they had a sustained peak. The third group of patients had an early peak which was not sustained, and the fourth group of patients who did not have an early peak but had a late rise. And what we see here, the reds are the patients who progressed, and the blues are the patients who had benefit and uh, the vertical axis is proliferation of cells, majority of the patients who had an early proliferation benefited from this. If you don't have an early peak with this particular subset of cells, and if, uh, then you don't benefit from these drugs. And in fact, a late peak doesn't seem to matter. So this tells us that within the first three, four weeks of therapy, you may be able to identify patients who respond or not. And we can even say which of these non-responders are rich in co-stimulatory or poor and co-inhibitory or vice versa, and maybe even be able to adopt therapy, adapt therapy rather, based on what they are lacking and see if you can give more of them. So this is still at a conceptual phase, but uh, we're now expanding this cohort to confirm these observations in a larger cohort, and uh, we're getting there. Now the other story that we're following uh, is based on a paper that was published in Nature about two years ago from Rafi's lab, which brought about <laughs> this whole concept of the CD8 positive T cells that are exhausted have two broad groups. One are those groups that are terminally differentiated, and the other are so-called stem-like T cells. These stem-like T cells have the transcription machinery. TCF1 is positive. They have a lot of co-stimulatory receptors, whereas the terminally differentiated cells are inhibitory in characteristic. They have a lot of uh, inhibitory molecules, and uh, they have effector characteristics. You need both of these. You need stem-like T cells, and you need the terminally differentiated cells. And in fact, when you give a PD-1 inhibition inhibitor, uh, in the preclinical models, these were all originally done in LCMV mouse models, which are not cancer setting, but we are seeing similar observations in cancer patients, is that these stem-like PD-1 uh, PD blockade results in two broad effects. One is in lymphoid tissues, which is where these stem-like CD8 T cells uh, are present, it causes self-renewal, which is necessary. And then at the tissue level, at the peripheral level, you start seeing differentiation of these stem-like cells into terminally differentiated cells, which are ultimately needed for uh, quelling the antigen that uh, the immune system is seeing. So the PD-1 inhibition has two effects, uh, one in the central lymphoid system and one in the peripheral uh, tissue level. And one, what you study in one may not be uh, applicable to the other. And one important point I wanted to make is, in the animal models, you can localize where these CD8 uh, stem cells, stem-like T cells sit. They sit in the T cell-rich zones of the lymph node. 
right next to where you have dendritic cells sitting. And that makes a lot of sense because you want the cells that recognize the antigen to be sitting very next to the dendritic cells where the antigen processing and presentation happens. And in fact, if you look for these in the tissue, you may not find them. Uh, you have to really look in the lymph nodes, which is where these are housed. And the fact that you follow all these markers in the blood is because these cells proliferate in the lymph nodes and are then uh, circulated to where they need to be, and therefore you're able to catch them in transit when you follow uh, blood. Now, uh, so we're studying the stem-like CD8 T cells in our uh, ongoing studies, and what we hope to show is uh, by monitoring these and by studying the kinetics of these stem-like CD8 T cells, we may be able to uh, better understand who is going to respond and how you may need to course correct in order to get optimal outcomes. Another line of research in our immunology group is the CD28. CD28 is a co-stimulatory molecule. And uh, in science, we published this paper last year, and there were two back-to-back -back papers. Our paper showed that when you give a PD-1 inhibitor, the proliferative burst uh, uh, of uh, T cells happens when you have CD8 co-stimulatory signals. If you don't have CD8 co-stimulatory signals, the proliferation does not occur, and that tells us co-stimulation is needed. The second paper actually went on to do uh, a little more in terms of understanding the structure, and you're well aware of this pathway. Basically, you have TCR signaling here, and this is PD-1. When PD-1 is activated, SHIP2 is recruited, and SHIP2 basically dephosphorylates the downstream uh, uh, phosphorylated proteins. And original thought was SHIP2 basically dephosphorylates the TCR and renders TCR signaling less effective. But structural studies published by the Genentech group in this paper uh, showed that the SHIP2 configuration may actually be more driven to the CD28. And what you see in terms of PD1-mediated uh, T cell exhaustion may be driven by lack of co-stimulatory signals in CD28. And this paper, we show that by giving uh, PD-1 inhibition, uh, you are basically deriving a response based on whether or not there is CD28 signals. So we started looking for CD28 in lung cancer specimens, and sure enough, you see them only in a third of the patients. And the question is, are these the third of the patients that have the best responses to PD-1 inhibition? And uh, we're uh, doing studies to uh, understand this phenomenon better. So this is another area where I think it can be helpful. CD28 is hard to target because it's ubiquitous, so it can be a biomarker. It cannot directly be a treatment target. But uh, finally, of course, combination immunotherapy is something of great interest, and uh, there are ways to stimulate the co-stimulatory pathways and inhibit the co-inhibitory pathways. Uh, many studies are ongoing here in our institution. And finally, I'll finish with this slide. This is the scheme for our SPORE project, uh, our SPORE that's being reviewed by NCI, uh, where we're looking at three different aspects of lung cancer. The first project involves uh, basically immune checkpoint inhibition. It builds on the observations that we have uh, shown in uh, terms of understanding the stem-like CD8 T cells and uh, the relevance of CD28 pathway, and that is a project that Rafi Ahmed and I co-lead. Uh, project two is on EGFR mutated lung cancer, where uh, the first in human uh, MER TK inhibitor is being combined with osimertinib with understanding of biological underpinnings. That's a project led by Doug Graham and Tofik Owanikoko from my group. And uh, finally, the third project is uh, applicable more broadly to targeting apoptosis. And this uh, is basically a novel way to target BACs, which is the final common step in apoptosis. And uh, Xingming Deng from our group had shown that phosphorylation at S184 site of BACs results in inhibition of downstream effects. And therefore, we have developed uh, BACs activators that would result in uh, apoptosis. And a lead compound has been identified. And the next step is to characterize the biology by which the drug works uh, more precisely, specifically in the setting of P53 mutations and uh, KRAS mutations, and uh, take this to the clinic and uh, our SPORE will be supported by core uh, shared resources. And uh, we uh, have learned a lot from Roy and uh, your group and other SPORs by attending the SPORE meeting last year and by following your research. So we hope that all of this will come to fruition to help us uh, also get into uh, the uh, SPORE program where we can all work together collectively. So with that, I'll thank you and uh, thank you for your kind attention. I'll be happy to take comments or questions.